live here. We live here. We live here. We live here. A project exploring race, class, power, poverty, systems, and the people, people they, they touch. touch. I'm Emmanuel Berry. And I'm Tim Lloyd. And from St. Louis Public Radio, this is We Live Here. On this episode, one long road, one big divided region, we give you a historical outline for the jigsaw puzzle of municipalities that make up St. Louis County. And then we spend some time with people living in different parts of that system. You know, different areas of town that are predominantly black and predominantly white. This was all farmland. Uh, Dohack's restaurant was on the corner of Lindbergh and Lime Ferry. And then Dave Sinclair Ford was built. It got to be like it was a fire sale. The subdivisions here, there was so many on a Sunday afternoon, open house, there was so many for sale. There were quite a number of Hispanics that lived here and had their businesses along the St. Charles Rock Road area. What's driven so much of what's bad about today is our family, the family. We don't have a family structure. St. Louis County has taken a lot of heat lately. No kidding. Yeah, for things like having 23 different school districts, having a bunch of municipal courts. And for having lawyers who work as prosecutors in one court and then serve as judges in another. And, you know, for that whole municipalities using their police departments like ATM machines. Right. Yeah, pulling people over and finding them just so they can stay afloat. Not to mention disproportionately pulling over African Americans for rinky-dink traffic fines. Folks like Vernell Boyd, who was waiting in line at a court in Pagedale, population 3,000. Back 15 years ago, it was a little more stricter. You know, they, they would be picking on any old thing. You know, they'd spot you and pull you over for nothing. Now they don't really pull you over for nothing as much. And sometimes those small fines turn into really big fines and sometimes even land people in jail. Again, usually poor people and often African Americans. We could go on here, but here's the thing. These teeny systems stem from one big system of the 90 municipalities that make up St. Louis County. And after all, this is a show about people and systems. So we have to ask, how the heck did we get here, this hodgepodge of towns? This multitude of municipalities. Surplus of cities. All right, that's enough, Tim. Fair enough. We like our alliteration. (laughs) The thing is, bottom line, how did St. Louis County sprout so many municipalities in the first place? At this point, allow us to make an introduction. Let's see. My name is Esley Hamilton, and I'm the preservation historian for St. Louis County Parks. At work? Hamilton gets calls about all sorts of stuff, including questions about how the county developed. He says there's a common misperception that most municipalities were specifically created to keep black people out. But according to Hamilton, the truth is more complicated. I went back through the Municipal League's directory and uh, I made a list of the 90 municipalities. 60 of them were incorporated in a very small window of time, starting in 1930 with Olivet up to 1950 with Town and Country in Riverview. And as the suburbs got bigger and bigger... Virtually every subdivision that was platted in St. Louis County during that period had a racial restriction in the deed that everybody honored. These covenants were already being used in the city of St. Louis. Yeah, and the restriction was that houses could only be sold to white people. So, in other words, racist housing policies were hardwired into these new subdivisions. So what Hamilton's really getting at is that people didn't need to create municipalities to keep segregation in place. He says the primary motivation for all these new towns was that the county had an old-school governing model set up for rural areas. And that model didn't do a good job providing services. Yeah, you know, things like good streets, garbage collection, policing. Yeah, exactly. And that motivated people to create their own little governments for these new white-only neighborhoods. And on top of all of that, Missouri state laws made it really easy to form a municipality. So in theory, you could create a town in just a few months. And it should be noted that some of these municipalities had zoning laws that kept housing out of the reach for poor people, regardless of race. But remember how that that big uptick in the number of municipalities stopped around 1950? Well, Hamilton explains what happened. The county passed a much more modern charter that set out modern departments, requirements for professional qualifications for department heads, and uh, really put the county on a 
much more professional basis. About the same time, based on a case from St. Louis, Shelley versus Kramer, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that race restrictions in deed covenants were unconstitutional. So you would think that would be the end of white towns keeping black people out. But people found a workaround. Of course. Around this time, Hamilton says you start to see a rise in what some people call blockbusting or redlining. Basically stuff realtors and banks did off the books to keep black people from buying houses in certain parts of town. But back to the formation of all these municipalities. Missouri law had been changed to make it harder to make a new town. Since 1950, only 12 municipalities have been formed in St. Louis County. And yet, our historian friend Elsie Hamilton says that it's in these post-1950 towns that you can start to see race specifically playing a factor by way of zoning laws. Most notoriously, uh, Blackjack, where Blackjack was specifically incorporated to block the construction of a multifamily uh, subsidized housing project, which was definitely race-related. I mean, I understand what you're saying, that these housing covenants were already in place. So this, you know, arguing that the municipalities specifically were created to reinforce segregation is open to a lot of interpretation. But there's also the flip side of that, that this system of municipalities maintained that system of segregation. Oh, I think that's true. All right, so however you interpret the backstory for municipal governments in St. Louis County. And we know there are lots of different interpretations. But many argue that the legacy is a system that divides people based on race, class, and a lot of the time, both. And numbers are numbers. Take a look at a map of demographics across the St. Louis region, and there is absolutely no doubt about it. White, black, rich, and poor people hardly ever live next to each other. So we wanted to get a sense of how people living in different parts of this jigsaw puzzle think about race and money, what their hope is for the future, and maybe their fears. With this in mind, we're taking a long drive up Lindbergh Boulevard. The road is shaped like a giant letter C and hooks its way from south to north. And you can see these divisions as you travel from south to north along Lindbergh. So our buddies in the St. Louis Public Radio newsroom helped us out by spending time with people who live and work along Lindbergh. We begin with Jason Rosenbaum, who starts in South County with the son of a local legend in the car biz. So I'm driving down the highway and I get off at Lindbergh Boulevard and I'm driving through South St. Louis County. It looks pretty much like every other part of that part of St. Louis County. Strip malls, modest homes, the whole shebang. And I see on my right-hand side a sign for Dave Sinclair Memorial <laughs> Highway. So does, does the road actually change its name there? Not only does it change its name, the name change was instituted by the Missouri General Assembly. <laughs> so I'm sorry, <laughs> not from here, but Dave Sinclair, who is Dave Sinclair? Well, Dave Sinclair is one of the biggest car dealerships around, and he's known for his distinctive advertisements. I am Dave Sinclair, the South County Ford dealer. Ford is going all out to sell a lot of cars this so, month. So, Dave one Sinclair, of Ford Auto, it must be a pretty big space. It's a big and a busy place. I actually had to wait about 40 minutes to talk with James Sinclair, the son of Dave Sinclair, but it didn't always start that way. Um, when we when he moved to Melville in the 1970s, he says what surrounded him was basically fields. This was all farmland. Uh, Dohack's restaurant was on the corner of Lindbergh and Lemay Ferry, and then Dave Sinclair Ford was built. But it turned out it was a good business decision to move to Melville because in the 1980s, the place boomed, and according to Sinclair, the dealership became one of the biggest in the entire country. In 1972, when my dad, Dave Sinclair, moved out here, he was already the largest Ford dealer probably in Missouri or the central United States. And then in the 80s, he was the largest Ford dealer in the United States of America for three years in a row. And that you can tie that directly to the population growth in the South County area, Oakville, Melville, Sunset Hills, uh, Arnold, that, that the population just exploded here kind of like it did maybe in the 90s in St. Charles County. So I want to set the scene a little bit more for Melville just in terms of of the numbers. Tell me about the demographics there. Melville is primarily white. I I think that it's in the 90s as far as the racial composition there. 
There is some diversity within ethnicities. There's a large Bosnian population that lives in South St. Mm-hmm. Louis County. But as far as, as racial demographics go, it's probably one of the lesser diverse places along Limburg Boulevard. Okay, so we're talking about Dave Sinclair, his son, James Sinclair, big-time car guys, a legendary family in the car biz, recognized by the Missouri State Legislature, yada, yada, yada. But we should step back and note that before all of this, Dave Sinclair was a cop in St. Louis. Yes, Dave Sinclair and his family grew up in North St. Louis City, and Dave Sinclair was a police officer before he was a car dealer. And that's provided his son with a unique perspective on what's gone on since Michael Brown's death. It sickens me to see St. Louis on the national news the way we have been portrayed Uh, There are issues that need to be addressed, uh, but they need to be addressed. They don't need to be shouted at, and they certainly don't need to take it out on the police. And James Sinclair went on to talk about a refrain that we've heard a lot in the last six months or so, and that there's good police and bad police, good citizens and bad citizens, and there has to be less yelling and more talking about problem solving. So James is reflecting on what's happened over the past few months, but how does he say we move forward? I think it goes back to what I just said, that the the many sides of this debate, quote unquote, have to stop yelling at each other and have to be less firm in their positions and start talking about common ground. And that could be a difficult thing when both sides are so strong in their opinions, whether it be people who gravitate toward the pro-law enforcement side or those who want law enforcement to change. But in his view, things aren't going to change unless people in this entire debate see each other as people. Just like he sees policemen as more than just mindless, faceless automatons because they're like his father. They're people that are in the community. And until, in his view, that sort of mentality comes to the forefront, not much is going to be changed. Okay, so our next stop along Lindbergh Boulevard is Kirkwood. And to take us there, we asked Joe Manis, one of our crack political reporters, (laughs) to go back to our roots. So your roots are in Kirkwood? I'm Okay, I'm confused. Joe's from Indiana. What are you talking about? Explain. Well, I am from Indiana, but when I came to the Post-Dispatch in the mid-1970s, Kirkwood was among the towns that were on my beat. Mm -hmm. Back then, all the young reporters uh, were assigned some of the 90 municipalities and 24 school districts in St. Louis County, and that's what you covered for a while. And I had Kirkwood then. I also had Hazelwood, some others. So I got to know Kirkwood pretty well back then. All right, so here you are, this crackerjack young reporter <laughs> covering Kirkwood. What was that town like around then? Well, in the late 1970s, they were really trying to reinvent themselves. They had raised some houses and businesses to put in a Target with a big parking lot Mm -hmm. and everything right in the middle of downtown. And they decided that that had been a big mistake. So what they did was they instituted a development plan that centered around being an 1880s railroad town. And and Kirkwood has this beautiful old rail station. Correct, correct. So this was all part of that. So Mm -hmm. anyone who was renovating their business or putting in a new development needed to have something, a design that fit in with that image. So something else also happened about that time. There was a big mansion just south of downtown that was in bad condition, and there was discussion about whether or not to demolish it. And two uh, local residents, women, came in and asked the council for approval to have it zoned so that they could put in a children's museum. Now, it started out small, but now it's this gigantic, uh, you know, the uh, Magic House, which is one of the most successful children's museums in the region. Yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds like Kirkwood put a lot of effort into downtown if everything is train themed. I mean, what, what's it like now? Did that did that stick? Yes, I like it a lot. I go there all the time. I live in Webster, but I like their library. I like their farmer's market. They also have a lot of downtown restaurants and coffee shops. The downtown is very vibrant, particularly compared to some of the other um, municipalities in the county that don't have such an alive downtown you really notice it when you when you drive along Lindbergh, which becomes Kirkwood Road when it hit the <laughs> Another boundaries of, those. of Kirkwood. <laughs> Lindbergh, the road of many names yes. there. Now, Kirkwood, if you want to know a little bit about the demographics, it's about 88% white, according to the latest census, about 12% minority. So it's fairly diverse, although like many communities in St. Louis area, it does have pockets uh, there's an old African-American community called Meacham Park, which is in south of downtown. And so many African-Americans still live there. And uh, 
Kirkwood generally leans Republican, but that's changing slightly. They just elected their first uh, Democratic state representative in a while. Uh, but that aside, um, there are, it's, a, it's a community that's known for its volunteerism. Uh, it has a real bipartisan spirit, a lot of civic interest, a lot of involvement. Their high school, uh, there's a theater near there. It's all um, a real center of activity. And that's sort of how I came across um, a woman named Marie Kelly, who says that she wouldn't live anywhere else. I love our community. We have a lot of people who are connected um, and who are interested in making it better, and we know our neighbors, and it's a great place to live. So I want to know more about this woman who loves Kirkwood so much. Tell me more about her. Okay, Marie Kelly has lived in Kirkwood about almost 20 years. She's in her mid-50s. She's white. She had long was a volunteer in the public schools there and just recently was elected to the school board. So she's very passionate about education. She has two daughters who are still in high school. She has a son who's now in college. So it seems like education is something that she's really interested in. Why education when there's all these other kind of volunteer things going on in Kirkwood? Well, Kelly has a really strong belief that the disparities in education, especially the achievement camp between white and black students in Kirkwood and elsewhere, are really at the center of some of the um, tensions racial tensions in the community, in the region, everywhere. And she really strongly feels that if you address the achievement gap, you address a lot of the other issues. And I think being on the school board, I have a, a broader perspective of what of the community and how different how different people have different opinions and they come from different walks of life. So maybe senior citizens think of things a little differently than a parent. And I think the other thing that has really been um, an eye-opener and to me is, you know, because we've had the unaccredited school district and transfers in, is just I think my urgency to eliminate the achievement gap has really grown strong. For someone who's not from the St. Louis region. What are these stereotypes that are typically associated with Frontenac? Well, Frontenac is first and foremost usually known for Frontenac Plaza, which has a number of high-end stores. Um, You know, the the, the very wealthy shop there. Oh, by the way, this is Nancy Fowler. She's our colleague. She went to Frontenac. The homes are large, and there's a one-acre limit. They have to be at least on one acre, except those that were grandfathered in. One-acre limit. (laughs) Yes. Um, the average income is something along 160000 household income. It is a community where people don't generally leave. You know, uh, there's not a lot of turnover, as Chris did. He kind of illustrates that in that he bought back the family home. It changed hands once before. Tell me, tell me about what his home looked like. Just describe that process of driving up to his home. Because if he lives on six acres, first of all, where are there six acres available in, in Frontenac right now? And just tell me about that process driving up to his home. Yes. Well, the home is on Clayton Road. It's not too far mm. from Plaza Frontenac. Um, the home sits back 350 feet from the road, which um, that's huge. is a long distance. Yeah. To get to the home from the road, you travel over an actual bridge under which some sort of water runs and under an 80-year-old cottonwood tree. And it almost seems as if you're driving into another you know, place ask, in is time. Is that like fairyland kind of? It is. So you're in this space that is isolated just because of the size because you have to drive down a giant driveway. Um, do you feel like in some ways the community in general is isolated from a lot of the other things going around around it? You know, I I don't know if I can speak to that. I mean, certainly Chris Kerr said he lived in a microcosm and uh, that the things that happen elsewhere don't seem to affect him. Did you get the feeling that he, that anything changed for him after Ferguson? That any, any worldview, any questions were raised, um, you know, just I- internally with, with him, you know, in your conversations uh, with with Chris, did you did you feel like for him that things had changed, or that he felt anything post Ferguson? Well, when I ask him that, I mean, you can clearly hear his response, and um, it indicates that the answer is no. No, no, I I didn't get involved. I didn't 
uh, what follow day to day, until you know the facts. Uh, it, I feel pretty strongly and passionately about this. To really, really know the facts, you, you can't judge. You have no idea, and everybody's racing to do that for whatever agenda they may have. But that's what happens, and it happens all the time. So. I don't follow these types of cases, whatever it is, a national case, the next, the new case, the next one that comes up, that whatever agenda is, somebody's running and wants to do it, I don't care. It, it, it's not relevant to my life, so I just, if I hear it on the news, but I, I stay out of it. So post-Ferguson, I've noticed being out, you know, as a reporter going out and talking to people about race, that sometimes you bring up this issue of race and people are really anxious, really nervous to share their opinions. Some people are very for- forthright with their opinions. What was just his general mood, his demeanor when you asked him questions about race? Well, Chris Kerr was very, um, he easily talked in general terms about race, as you can hear in this tape. I don't think there's a, a great divide. I really don't. I think there are a few that, that want to believe it's true, or, but no. I don't think so. But when he talked about why St. Louis may be having problems, he agreed with his father-in-law that um, the problem is that kids aren't growing up in two-family homes and that fathers uh, are missing and that mothers are at work. And um, when I pressed him on that as to what the reason might be, you can see that it became kind of awkward. It was driven so much of what's bad about today is our family the family we don't have a family structure that that's the basis for how <clears throat> what makes our country great it's just it's it's gone and that's that's why we have so much more unrest and so much more crime and so many more uh problems today because <clears throat> our some of the kids are being raised in families that don't promote that that don't provide the support, the, the values, the discipline, <clears throat> the accountability that's necessary to make us all individuals that can, uh, can get along, interact, do business, socially, all that. And that's uh, so much of that is, is gone. We don't have that same structure as we did when I was younger. Why do you think that is? Um, well... Probably a number of reasons. I'm not sure if I really want to get into it. I don't really don't, if you don't mind. I'm just wondering, as this guy who's really at the very, very top of what, in, in many respects, you can have in St. Louis, um, he, he's got it all, right? What's his hope for the future? Just keep on trucking? Exactly, exactly. He and Martha both agreed. Things are good. Life is good. They wouldn't change a thing. They just hope for the best. They said um, they just try not to get into situations where they have to hope for anything. So we're leaving Frontenac now, and we're leaving behind one set of stereotypes. We're moving north up Lindbergh Boulevard into North County, where we encounter a whole different set of stereotypes, and we're stopping in St. Anne. And to take us to St. Anne, we have Dury Buscarin. Uh, tell us a little bit about the city. What does it look like? All right, so you're driving north on Lindbergh. Um, St. Anne is off to the right, uh, right before you get to the airport. And the first thing you'll probably see is a mom-and-pop diner. Um, And then a little bit further beyond, you will see what used to be the Northwest Plaza. Um, It was this huge, thriving mall in the 70s and 80s. uh, And then really, along with the rest of North County, fell on hard times in the 2000s. Um, And these department stores started to leave um, it was a huge loss to property taxes for St. Anne, and the mall was actually foreclosed in 2010. Right now, um, it's been going through a major redevelopment, which I think people are watching with kind of a cautious optimism because they've been burned before. Um, and then there's another thing that kind of compounded the city's decline, and that's what happened to the Latino population in St. Anne. Wait, Latino population in the St. Louis region? I mean... As we know, there aren't a lot of Latinos here. What's what's going on in St. Anne? 
Right. So about 3% of people in St. Louis County identify as Hispanic or Latino. Um, But St. Anne used to have a really strong Latino community, about 800 people in a town of 13,000. And they owned a lot of local businesses, which brought in a lot of shoppers. In fact, I met one woman, uh, Sister Roseanne Ficker, who actually set up a Catholic ministry for Spanish speakers back in 2003. And here's how she described what's changed in St. Anne. There were quite a number of Hispanics that lived here and had their businesses along the St. Charles Rock Road area. And you go up and down those now and you find many of them are closed. And part of that was the attitudes of some of the law enforcement officers. Um, But it it had been difficult. And um, so many of the places have closed down. Many of the Hispanics have moved out of St. Anne, and they're in Overland and all the other neighboring areas here. Okay, so what happened? I mean, why so many fewer Latinos and Hispanics in St. Anne? It was traffic stops. Hmm. I mean, if you look at racial profiling data over the past 15 years, Latinos were about twice as likely as whites to be stopped by police. African Americans were also disproportionately stopped. But we're told that during these traffic stops, St. Anne police were also frequently calling immigration authorities. Um, when they stopped someone who didn't have a driver's license, for example. Constantly uh, stopped for whatever reason, okay, and many times were arrested on the spot, taken to jail. Some the immigration was called. uh, So it it was a pretty heavy situation. So are you saying that there's a connection between policing practices, in particular racial profiling, and the economic downturn in St. Anne? So... I would say that multiple residents that I spoke with made that connection between the Hispanic and Latino families that no longer felt comfortable living in St. Anne, Mm -hmm. about the Hispanic-owned grocery stores and businesses that lost customers during that time and then closed down. So most of the Latino population has moved out, left St. Anne. What's the relationship like right now with police in the community? Actually, residents say there's been a shift. Um, As Sister Ficker mentioned, uh, they're doing mandated cultural sensitivity training, and there's a newly elected police chief, Aaron Jimenez. And he grew up in St. Anne, served on the municipal police force for most of his career. Um, And when he was elected two years ago, he really committed to building a bridge with the Hispanic community here and ending these traffic stops. But there's a lot of broken trust, um, and his police department today isn't without its share of controversy. I mean, Just a couple months ago, they were in the news for accidentally arresting and injuring a young black man who they thought was a suspect. Did Sister Ficker have anything to say about Ferguson or race relations in the St. Louis area just in general? She did talk about how St. Louis is such a divided region Mm -hmm. and how that makes it so much harder for people to talk to each other and just have daily interactions with each other. You know, I have to ask, too, because I'm hearing all this background noise and all the cuts that we're playing. Uh, what's what's going on? Um, so I met Sister Ficker uh, on Multicultural Night <laughs> at her uh, church in St. Anne, and everyone had brought a dish from a different part of the world, mm-hmm. and they were sitting down together and eating together, and, you know, little kids are running around <laughs> dancing the Macarena. Um, and she told me that nights like that really give her hope. I think the more we can work together Together, the more we can see each other as brother and sister, really, truly all children of God, that makes such a difference in how we look at each other. So if we can get that attitude back into our system, into our veins, <laughs> I, that would make a big difference. All right. Well, good luck getting that song out of your head over the next, I don't know, half an hour or so, you'd say? Yeah, about, I'm already really annoyed <laughs> right now. I'm very annoyed right now. Uh, we should make a note here that Shula, the editor, our, our beloved editor for this project, we love Shula. We do, yep. But she made us put that song in this podcast. We would never do that to you guys. No, we would not. That is cruel and mean. Um, let, let's get away from the Macarena. <laughs> let's move beyond this, uh, continue with the podcast. Uh, so next, we're our next stop, I guess. Our, it's not a stop quite. It's a, it's a, it's detour. a detour. It's a detour. Uh, Tim, Tim took us on a detour. Tim, where are we going? <laughs> All right. So I, I admit I broke the rules, but I traveled through Florissant to get to this destination. And Florissant technically is a stop along Lindbergh Boulevard. And it's one of the big municipalities in St. Louis County. It has a population of about 52,000. About uh, 70% of people there identified as being white on the most recent census. 28% said that they were black. It's 
pretty middle class. Uh, median income is roughly fifty two grand. The housing stock, I mean, it looks like North St. Louis County. So it's 50s, 60s, 70s style ranches and split levels. Florissant's southern border stops at Interstate 270, which is this, this big highway that commuters in St. Louis have come to know and love. There's, you're being sarcastic. I there. am being okay, totally good. sarcastic there. Okay, good. And just across 270 in Ferguson, which I think is a municipality that needs no introduction at this point, uh, is the Florissant Valley campus of St. Louis Community College. Oh, so the college... This is where I broke the rules. The the college is in Ferguson, is what you're saying? Right, exactly. Okay, Um, but Ferguson doesn't touch Lindbergh. No. Lindbergh at all. Yes. I know, I know. Okay, why... Tim, why are you doing this? Well, I met someone... these rules for a reason. I know, I know. (laughs) Why are you doing this? Uh, (laughs) Fair question. So I met someone there who I think can kind of give us an interesting window into race relations across a region that's carved up based on race and class. Okay. So so who is this person? All right. Her name is Mallory Barnes. She's 28 years old and African-American, studying to get her associate's degree in paralegal studies. And on top of going to school, she's also working, get this, three jobs. That is a lot of jobs to work. Uh, Yeah, it's a lot of jobs to work. But I caught up with her... Just after she got off work and before class in the student center at uh, this St. Louis Community College uh, Florissant Valley campus. And she just has this, I don't know, just just really positive attitude about things. I do like being able to wear these different hats. Like, it's it's made me think more about what I see myself doing in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like that I'm able to manage it all, too. Um, But yes, in the near future, I would like to just have one, maybe two jobs. So she's planning to go on and earn her bachelor's degree, and her dream is to go to law school. But Mallory says as it stands, it's pretty hard to see how she could afford that. But, I mean, you said she's working three jobs now. Um, What is she doing? Right, so she does some filing work at a law firm in St. Charles County. She works at an Irish bar. And on the weekends, get this, she gives out free booze at supermarkets. Seriously? Yes. Yeah. Technically, this is called being a promotional model, And she goes to supermarkets all over the region on the weekends. Who doesn't need a drink when they're going through a crowded grocery (laughs) store on the weekend? Because I know I do. Yeah, but uh, even though she brings free booze and this really upbeat attitude with her, I wondered, as an African-American, if she gets treated a little bit differently based on where the supermarket she's working at is located in this big, divided region. Yeah, um, for the most part. Most of them are the same as far as how I interact with with people and how they interact with me. There are a few in South St. Louis County um, where it's just not the same. It's I, I'm not received the same way. I'll put it like that. Like, I'm there, but I'm not there. Whereas everywhere else, you hand out free liquor. They want to know what's up. I try not to, like, think about it too much, but I, there is... You know, that sense of, well, maybe it's because I'm black. (laughs) Maybe that's why nobody's really, like, paying attention to me or hearing me when I say, hey, how you doing, or or whatnot. Now, again, she says it's not like this all the time, but when it does happen. It's usually with older people, older white people. And I kind of understand that, you know, they're from a different time. And, I mean, I don't go home and cry about it. Like, I don't lose sleep over it. I just, I, I peep it, though. I definitely peep it. And like just about everybody else we talk to, she says the best way to ease racial tensions is... Wait for it. Talk to each other. And while she says those kind of conversations are starting to happen, there's a long way to go. And with that, what do you say, Emmanuel? We make the one last stop? Yeah, it's my stop. What is that? Would that be the sound of my favorite co-host, Emmanuel, singing... (laughs) In the car? Would that be right? I'm your favorite co-host now. <laughs> yes, it's me singing. I love that song too. It's a good song. It I know. It's a good song. Uh, I, okay, I'll explain. Uh, so, Blackjack is a solid 30 minute drive from where I live. So, I was doing some singing for entertainment's sake. So, don't judge. I'm not judging at all. Like I said, I love that song. Okay, all right. Uh, well, I guess the reason I had the microphone on though was because I wanted to give people a sense of what I was seeing as I was driving around Blackjack. Not a lot of businesses, not a lot of traffic. It's actually really creepily quiet. Um, And yes, I know this is super safe. Driving and talking into a microphone is not distracted driving. All right, so if it's so quiet, tell me about what is going on there. 
Not a lot exactly. <laughs> um, you know, Blackjack has lots of houses. Uh, it's really residential. There are lots of subdivisions, and it's just not really that big. Uh, there's only around 7,000 people, uh, and most of that population is black. Uh, blackjack is over 80% black. Uh, but about 40 years ago, that population was almost completely white. Whoa. That is, I mean, that's a big change. So what's going on there? Yeah, that is a big change. And I wanted to get a sense of what that change actually looked like. Uh, so I wanted to speak to someone who's been living in Blackjack for a while. So um, I found Benjamin T. Allen Sr. He moved to Blackjack in 1974. Uh, and when he moved to the area, there were hardly any other black families. Uh, we moved, uh, as we moved, we were moving the uh, small items, the, uh, the, the neighbor was, who was white uh, the, the wife came over and asked who was moving into the house, and I identified myself as the owner. And she then told us merely that uh, her um, uh, her husband was a was six foot two and that he was a karate expert. And we both we all looked at one another as to what the heck what did that mean? And, uh, and she never really said uh, hello or anything else. And she just wanted us to know. And she and she turned around and she left. Then as after once we moved in, there was a white couple on each side of us. And for one year, they didn't even acknowledge that our presence here. They never spoke. They never made eye contact. And then finally, after about a year, the neighbor on the left came over one day when I was unloading in my garage, something out of my car from work. And he said, can we have a beer? Which shocked me. And that began some of the, uh, some of the um, uh, getting along. Alan says, uh, besides a few incidents like this, he never really had too many issues in Blackjack. Uh, he says, you know, people are really friendly. It's a quiet community, a great place to raise his children. Um, and it's a community that he really grew to love. Uh, he loved it enough that he decided to run for local office. He served on city council for 34 years. Oh, no years. kidding. Yeah, today he still represents the fourth ward. Wow, that is a long time to be a civil servant. Okay, so uh, from that perspective, what's the biggest change to the community during his tenure? It would have to be demographics, uh, hmm. you know, which Allen attributes in part to white flight. Mm -hmm. uh, white started moving away to West County mostly. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Allen notes that the real estate agents who were showing houses in Blackjack were only showing them to African Americans. It got to be like it was a fire sale. The subdivisions here, there was so many on a Sunday afternoon, open house, there was so many for sale. I mean, uh, open house signs at the front of the various entrances of the various subdivisions that the city had to pass an ordinance uh, to prevent uh, the uh, putting up for sale signs, I mean, open house signs in front of subdivisions to try to stem some of that. Uh, they were concerned about it. But that was the, the normal white flight that once uh, that uh, blacks uh, became somewhat of a majority or a, a percentage uh, that uh, property values would go down. So I think it's important to note here that when we talked about blackjack briefly earlier in this podcast, our guest, the historian Esley Hamilton, mentioned Blackjack as a municipality that was specifically incorporated to block a subsidized housing project, uh, which he said was race-related. And so I'm curious what Alan thinks about the circumstances of the city's incorporation. He says he understands why there was this desire to block the housing project. Because, no kidding. Yeah. I mean, huh. because at the time, this was shortly after Peru Igo. At that time, uh, uh, it was right during the time when the when the when HUD, the federal government, had was failing in the Puritt Argo mm -hmm. Peabody Clinton, and it was quite upsetting. So the, the people, of course, was I could understand them being upset, and I, and I agreed with them because I would I would have I would have voted the same. I would have been the same way. All right. So if I understand him correctly, he's saying the Blackjack's founding wasn't so much a race thing as it was a reaction to the stigma and problems of public housing, especially in the wake of Pruitt Igo. Yes, I mean. Pruitt Igo was this huge housing project that was built in the 1950s, uh, and it was supposed to kind of be the future of public housing for the entire country. Uh, but things spiraled out of control. There wasn't 
it wasn't maintained properly and it became a hotbed for crime and literally was demolished in the 1970s. And, you know, just Alan, before Blackjack was found. Yeah, just before it was found. And yeah. Alan actually witnessed this. Um, and, you know, when he was looking for his first home, he was actually thinking about Pruitt Igo. Um, you know, at the time it was it was fancy and it was yeah. new and it was, you know, the future is kind of how it was proposed. Um, and he couldn't even get in. Uh, and in hindsight, he's really glad that he didn't. I, I'm just trying to put all this together. If he was around when Pruitt Igo was going up, he must have lived during the housing covenants. Yeah, he, he did. Uh, Benjamin Allen actually grew up in the Ville, right. uh, which was one of the few mm-hmm. areas where blacks mm-hmm. could live in the city under housing covenants. Um, he grew up in that system of separation, and he grew up when you know people weren't accepted for who they are. And today, he says a lot of those things are still ingrained. And he doesn't think that they're going to change in his lifetime. He doesn't know if Ferguson will change things either. It's brought about more conversation about race relations and that sort of thing. What will come out of it, I don't know. Oftentimes things are like a flash. It happens and then, then it dies and then disappears and you go through the same thing over and over again. And, uh, and there's always been some kind of commission or board or something that's going to study something and study and they've studied things to death and it's the same study, study. And when you already know what it is, it has to do with race, period. I'm sure by this point, you'll all have your own conclusions. But here's the big takeaway for us. Easing racial tensions is complicated. But everyone we talked to said a good place to start is just by hanging out with people who are different than you. And not just at a commission meeting, but at a coffee shop. Not just in the break room at work, but waiting around during parent-teacher conferences. Not just at a demonstration for or against police, but at a block party or a backyard barbecue. But there's a system in St. Louis County that makes it hard for all of those interactions to actually happen in the real world. So, on our next episode, Growing Up in a Divided Region. How what kids see in school shapes how they think about race and money. We'll have that for you on March 23rd. uh, And from there, we'll start our regular schedule of posting episodes every other Monday. We Live Here is produced by me, Emmanuel Berry. And me, Tim Lloyd. Shula Newman is our beloved editor and fervent dog lover. Margie Fry Vogel is the editor of St. Louis Public Radio. Our theme music was composed by Cassie Morgan from St. Louis Public Radio. This is We Live Here. Support for this podcast comes from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.